Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. Trade is the key to long-term sustainable economic change and growth and also the development in Africa, which is much needed. Trade is critically important to economic development. Right now, Africa has about 2% of all the world trade, which is hard to believe when you think about all the tremendous resources that the continent has oil, diamond, agriculture, not to mention the products it gives, coffee, tea, cocoa, and to think that it has only 2% of world trade is really incredible. But the power of trade is that if Africans were able to increase their shares of the world trade from 2 to 3%, that 1% increase would actually generate about $70 billion of additional income annually for Africa, or about three times the total development assistance Africa gets from the entire world. Many countries in Asia and the Latin America have tremendous changes in their activities, particularly in the technological sector and also agricultural sector. Africa needs to start seeing a way of increasing their trading with other international countries and see how they can improve growth in the sectors which they know they can handle best. This alone will boost their economic change and definitely will affect each and every one in the different countries in around the continent. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about trade in the sub-region and its advantages to the different African countries. This is what we are talking about today on the program Views on the Continent. Afrique Media. Le monde. Nous. Economy is key to the African continent if we want growth to actually exist. Ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome to Views on the Continent on your Pan African channel, Africa Media. So, we're going to talk about trade in the sub zone and the advantages which it brings to the continent and how we could use these advantages to build our country because it's not politics that's going to build the country, the continent. We think economic growth is what we have to put at the forefront in order for the continent to have the first lift which it needs. So I have two specialists with me in the studio and over Zoom who are going to throw more light on this particular topic and talk about what they are doing in order to boost this economic sector on the continent, handling different parts and how can it go as far as people talk about advantages and then what they have been doing the activities and how so far it has impacted the continent so i present to you dr lucy newman who is the ceo of africa private sector summit and also an author good afternoon dr lucy welcome to the program thank you manuela thank you for the invitation <laughs> Thank you for honoring our invitation. We also have Mr. John Bosco Kalisa. He's also the CEO of the East African Business Council. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you, Emanuela, and uh, good afternoon and greetings from uh, East Africa. You're welcome to the program. So let's start by watching this short video which mm -hmm. was sent to us by Madam Lucy, and then we'll come back to get into details of what the Business Council is doing and also what the African private sector has been doing so far. A thriving private sector is essential for Africa to achieve inclusive growth, but structural economic issues remain an obstacle. There are generic things that seem to be across. Um, you mentioned the issue of power outages, the unemployment, and climate change issues. Yes, power outages are almost generic across Africa, largely because many of the power and energy infrastructure are actually obsolete, and many of our traditional um, power sources are not in line with modern equipment and do not explore renewable energy in terms of hydro, solar, and what have you. This calls for a need to look at our energy system across the continent to explore energy sources that we are naturally endowed with and then explore the use of more modern infrastructure for energy uh, generation and distribution and even in terms of regulation and opening that market. 
In terms of unemployment, that is a very serious issue across the continent, especially youth unemployment, and that is also linked to many of our security issues across the continent. Um, the economic um, inequality and jobs, these are very serious issues. Africa Private Sector Summit CEO Dr. Lucy Newman says business remains a large part of the continent's growth story. She's advocating for a Bill of Rights for the private sector to enable it to thrive. We call it the, private, the Charter on Private Sector Development, Rights and Protection Environment in Africa and is about creating and enabling business environment in Africa. We have about 24 rights now, but these rights are not new. <laughs> they are actually existing as uh, REC protocols and after protocols, many of which have actually been signed by many various heads of states in Africa. She concedes that some of the rights envisioned and new opportunity to operate and run a business and register a business across Africa for legitimate businesses. The issue of um, a currency within which we can trade and exchange goods and services across the country. The, some challenges with the port system for importation and clearance of goods and services. Uh, multiple taxation by various agencies of the government that tend to increase the price of goods and services and make it very difficult. Uh, other things are um, opportunity for shared ownership of enterprise. The, some other aspects have to do with the issue of um, visa, ability to move around in Africa. And then uh, we, have, we have so many, 24 of them. And these are just basic uh, rights that are important for enterprise to thrive. Newman adds that buy-in from the continent is vital. First level has been done, that's why we have the 28 and the charter. The second level of the process is the regional ratification and verification. Uh, we will move around the five regions of the continent, plus one which is diaspora, to share these uh, 24 and have people respond to them and validate them. As we go around the five plus one regions, we also have one mega continental event at which the ratification will be concluded. That second phase is in collaboration with PASI, Pan-African Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Thereafter, uh, the African Business Council, will, who is also a partner to uh, APSS, will take it up in advocacy at the AU. Um, ABC is AU recognized agency and it will uh, take it for the ratification by the AU Heads of State Summit. If that gets ratified and we're able to get at least um, adoption by 22 countries following the same pattern that was used for AFTA, then that would be a very good accompaniment instrument for the REX and AFTA protocols as a means of uh, developing the private sector, giving the private sector its right of place in the African economy. Newman says a Bill of Rights could help the private sector navigate economic headwinds. She says this already exists within regional economic communities and the African Continental Free Trade Area Protocols, making integration seamless. Thank you very much for that video. Thank you very much, Dr. Newman, for sending us this information. It really elaborates. But let me just begin with you, Dr. Newman, first of all, because we've heard a little bit what um, it's all about, what you have been doing. But tell us, first of all, what is the African Private Sector Summit all about? What do they stand for? Why the name? What have they been doing? So tell us the main things first. So those who don't know about it can, first of all, understand what this institution is all about before we start talking about what you're doing. The APSS, African Private Sector Summit, is a non-profit, non-partisan organization and pan-African. It has been around from 2000 and even before 2000. But however, most of the summits started 2001, 2002. We have had APSS Series 1, APSS Series 2, and APSS Series 3. At each of these summits, unlike other summits, each summit ends in an action plan. 
The first two summits were delivered with support from UNECA and it built on the environment, awakening the giant and uh, righting the wrongs of doing business amongst other things. Thereafter, it was discovered that there needs to be a model to engage the private sector because in every economy all over the world, the private sector has always been front and center. But in Africa, it has been the opposite. So we, that led to the development. Am I cracking? Are you hearing me very well? Okay. So that led to the development of the first draft of the charter. And after a lot of engagements, we now came up with the final draft of this charter. The essence of this charter for the APSs is that it, APSs does not work alone. We use the principle of Ubuntu, working as an ecosystem in collaboration with other entities across Africa. In line with that, we have always worked together in an ecosystem base, therefore, the charter as we have today, even though it is with APSs, so many agencies have contributed to the development of this charter. And right now, as I mentioned earlier in that video, PASI is part of this process to this stage and into the next phase. So what we're trying to do in the next one is the roundup around the continent by regions. That was where I was very happy to see my brother, Mr. John, on this, <laughs> on this program. Yeah speaking as well so for us as APSs we are a think tank and we are also a do tank we do what we have agreed at the end of each summit and subsequent summits are growth from the last activities right now to see the rollout continentally it also meant that our own internal capacity had to be enhanced that is why some things were done. We, are, we updated our structure and created the, uh, the advisory board and the executive board. And then there were new executives that joined the organization such that in the advisory board and in the executive board, we have representation by sub-regions, North Africa, East Africa, South Africa, Central Africa, and even diaspora by continent. So all these people are going to be on that such that when we're going around the regions, those people who are really from that region are the anchors. We're just facilitating the process. Okay. And thereafter, we have the Continental, which has already been agreed to be hosted by Botswana, Republic of Botswana. And thereafter, uh, African Business Council, which Mr. John <laughs> is affiliated with, will now take over and take it to the AU Summit. So that's what APSS has been doing. We've, we've been working the talk, even when we're at... Um, UN Global Compact in New York uh, in September, we had an opportunity to network and that was our message. So also, God willing, we're going to be at AITF, the Intra-African Trade Fair in Cairo later this month. And we're also approaching all this. And we're so excited that after Continental Secretariat has agreed to have a side event in collaboration with APSS and its ecosystem, just to focus on this Bill of Rights. So this is also an invitation to all those who are going to be in Cairo to please uh, visit the APS uh, after Secretariat uh, Pavilion and find out the day that we are having this side event so that we can all contribute. At the end of the day, the Bill of Rights should be ours, Africa's, and with the voice of everybody. That's why we're going around the regions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I like the fact that you said that you, your team is not only a think tank, but you're a do tank because we have a lot of associations, organizations on the continent. Uh, do you, you hear they have meetings and summits, but at the end, what they've decided never comes to pass or we don't feel the impact. So that's the nice one about that. I'm back with you in a moment. Let's talk with um, Mr. John. Um, I know you're an economist and you're the head of the Business Council in East Africa. How is East Africa doing? Because Central Africa, when it comes to economic and business, is down. So tell us has East Africa doing and what the Business Council has been doing so far? Thank you, Emmanuel. And I want to convey my greetings to my sister, Dr. Lucy. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to share with you the insight yeah. uh, of the East African Business Council and the East African community. Uh, let me start with the East African Business Council. Uh, we are the voice and a mouthpiece of private sector in East Africa. East Africa is one of the 
fast growing regional economic communities among the uh, the eight communities, uh, regional communities recognized by African Union. So we are at the forefront uh, in terms of uh, really looking at uh, a conducive business environment. And our role as a African Business Council has been to engage uh, the partner states, so our governments, in terms of uh, really ensuring that uh, uh, the business environment is conducive to do business, mm -hmm. uh, to do investment, cross-border investment, yeah. as well as to promote uh, foreign direct investment within our region. So you've asked how, how is the region doing? Uh, the region is doing quite quite well, commendable. Okay. And I wanted to share with you some some good insight that uh, which I want also Dr. Luz to look at when you look at the recent report by African Development Bank uh, on the East African economic outlook, uh, our average uh, GDP growth is around 5.1%. Wow. We, we, we are recording the highest growth across the continent. Uh -huh. uh, some countries like Rwanda are posting almost 8% growth. And others, uh, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania are doing the same. So what I would say that uh, the public-private dialogue is working. It is working for the better of the region, but also for the better of the continent. So uh, we, we at the East, East Africa, we believe that prosperity is created by the private sector. Mm -hmm. The role of government is really to uh, create a necessary environment for the private sector to drive growth, to drive job creation. And that is what we've been doing. And um, our our vision as a South African Business Council is a, a borderless East Africa for trade and investment. We want to dismantle those borders, the colonial borders, because they impact on our trade. They create barriers to trade. So with that, we've really seen uh, a number of uh, positive uh, trends, impressive records in terms of job creation within the region in terms of growth, in terms of uh, foreign direct investment, as well as cross-border investment coming to the region. So we are also excited that uh, East Africa uh, is uh, playing a central role with regard to the continental free trade area. Uh, among eight countries that were, among eight countries that were selected under a guided trade initiative, uh, three of them came from East Africa. Uh, wow. One is Rwanda, the second is Kenya, the third is the United Republic of Tanzania, and within the second phase that is being uh, finalized, other member states are also coming on board under the trade initiative. We have already uh, taken advantage of the continental free trade area. Uh, we are trading with our counterparts in West Africa. We are trading with our counterpart in the uh, Sadak region. We are engaging our counterparts in the ECAS. So we are very excited and what we are doing currently is really preparing our regional value chain, not only to feed into continental value chain, but also into global value chain. And quickly, I would um, uh, mention some of the value chain we are pushing. Uh, that is um, uh, textile and garments. We are looking at leather, leather related products. We are looking at the automotive sector, we also are working on pharmaceutical value chain as well as creative value chain. Uh, arts, because uh, a number of our youth, uh, women in business are engaged, are engaged in two arts and creative industry. So I think it is very exciting. And uh, perhaps what, to, what I, I want to mention is that uh, we, we, are, we are riding on a political wheel. Our heads of state are really committed to ensure that the private sector drives the growth, drives the prosperity, and they are making all efforts to address some of the binding constraints uh, related to uh, transport and logistics, issues related to uh, patient capital or long-term finance, issues related to non-tariff barriers, which are related to customs procedures, and uh, issues related to standards and SPS measures. So there is an enormous efforts and excite excitement in East Africa that uh, we need to unite ourselves, we need to work together, government and, and, and the private sector, in order to achieve a win-win situation. 
perhaps in the, in the midst of their uh, Emanuela. Okay, thank you very much for explaining that. So, so um, let's talk about this impact. When we heard President William Roto of Kenya announcing, announcing that he's taking off visa from all countries, like you don't need a visa to get into Kenya to do business and all other things, what has been the impact of such a decision when it comes to trading with other African countries and even internationally? What has been the Im impact to the whole of East Africa with this decision? And if other presidents take such a de decision, what is going to be the impact? The, the impact is huge, Emanuela. And uh, let, me, let me say that uh, um, Kenya is not the first to do that. that. Rwanda did it. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, Rwanda has waived off all the visa for Africans. Uh, so it is easier to, uh, to look at the, the positive uh, impact by visa removal. You see an enormous uh, investment flows or trade flows to Rwanda. And as I mentioned, statistically, and uh, your Rwanda is the, now the fastest growing uh, economy in the world because of uh, uh, creating a conducive uh, environment uh, for uh, tourists, for businesses, for investors across the continent. So I think the, there is a good learning lesson and Kenya coming on board. Uh, and I think also other countries are coming on board because the integration is about people centered. People must enjoy the fruits of uh, integration. Mm -hmm. And the number of people have been constrained by those barriers, including travel-related barriers. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said that our readers now are, are, are awake in terms of understanding that those barriers don't generate prosperity. Those barriers, including visa requirements, are hindering prosperity. So I think this is a wake-up call for all the heads of state, yeah. what Kenya is doing. Yeah. The, the effects are very positive, are very enormous. You can see even as uh, that we are looking at the data, Kenya is ahead of a number of countries in terms of uh, attracting investment, attracting the flows, oh. trade flows. A number of uh, organizations are establishing in Kenya. A number of investments is coming to Kenya. Kenya is going to reach a double-digit growth by that, by just a simple measure by, of removing the visa yeah. to Africans. Yeah. And I think it is exciting. And as a East African Business Council, mm -hmm. we want to commend and congratulate His Excellency Dr. William Ruto yeah. for that noble, noble, very noble initiative. And I really want to congratulate him for doing that. And I call upon all African, because now my sister Lucy was, uh, was mentioning about intra-regional trade in, uh, in Cairo. I've been, it has taken me a whole week applying for visa, eh? a whole week for it's Africans so to move into African continent. Yeah. It's a sad situation, a very absurd situation. Why Why should I? Yeah, I don't want to go and stay in Cairo. What I'm going to do there, I'm going to do networking, to do business. So we've been really, uh, uh, we've been really creating poverty for our own, for our own people, for ourselves, by erecting such a barriers to trade. Definitely. Thank you very much for talking on this, Mr. John Bosco. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Lucy, he just he, he mentioned something which people don't, it's as if before our leaders did not really see the impact of such acts. And even now, what all the African uh, free trade is talking about and the advantages, still now some, or some other presidents are not still seeing the importance, given that they are taking it very slow, like even rectifying the decision is a problem. And then removing the visas only for Africans even is still a problem so as he just said to go to Cairo for a seminar you you need probably a month or so to file in and then the documents and it might probably be refused you're just going there for a business not to go stay there so this is really hindering activities in the continent I think it's high time that other presidents see the way these other countries are moving and then can copy that so let's talk about the private sector which you're so much into it and you give uh, one of the reasons why you're focusing on it because that is true like in some countries the private sector people don't even look at it because there are no really laws on it following whatsoever it isn't as if finances are not in that side everybody's struggling for the government to employ them and I don't know if the government can employ the whole country it's never possible so far since you all there started working on this private sector probably trying to call on people to invest more in this private sector and change some of the rules and regulations that are there so far has the reaction been and has the impact been on the different countries you're working on or the regions 
Thank you very much, Emanuela. And just to piggyback on what my brother John said, for, for me, uh, like coming from East, West Africa, going to East Africa, if I happen to have two countries, I'm going to I'll be processing two or three visas. That's crazy. But for us in West African region, that is okay. If I'm going to Senegal, I'm going to Ghana, I don't need a pass uh, visa within the West African sub-region where we've gone that. But if you're moving from one region to another, that is the problem. Uh, in terms of the private sector, in our engagements, one of the things that also come out is that many of the private sector players, they're having challenges in terms of skills that are available within the African continent, skills that are usable at the workplace. Many of our educational institutions have been structured in such a way that the skills that are being produced and yeah, the graduates theory. that are coming out, many of them are not many of them are not ready for the workplace. So therefore, in view of that, the African Education Trust Fund is also one of the things that has come out of the engagement with the private sector within the APSS space. The African Education Trust Fund seeks to engage our educational institutions on the continent, look at the curriculum, look at the certifications to make sure, and as well as the vocational trade centers, so that skills and trade groups can have the applicable requirements that feed into the private sector and even into the public, such that production, the essence is conversion. Africa is so blessed with natural resources. However, we need to convert these natural resources into value added products that can be used internally and also can be exported to generate income just in line with the aspirations of the african continental free trade area so apss is moving two things the issue of the private sector bill of rights to give the private sector opportunity to thrive and to engage and to work in line with that so that jobs can be created and the private sector pays taxes and governments require these taxes as revenue to provide the services to the people. So in line with that, that came out. And in addition to that, the need to look at the educational system and the vocational trade groups is very important. And that leads into the trade groups, the associations. My brother John spoke about them looking at the textiles and the various industry clusters. So that's how the process is mutating along the way. For us as um, APSS, we gather, we speak, we extract what has been discussed, and we push it forward as a policy intervention for the continent to implement. And we measure along the way to see what is working, what is not working. And we go along also, not as APSS alone, but Ubuntu is an African philosophy. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we want to work in partnership. And it's also part of the 17 SDG goals, working in partnership to achieve the goal of the integrated, economically integrated Africa, taking care of all the trade and non-trade barriers. If we go into the issue of tariffs, some of the issues are very complicated and highly incentivizing. So, so those kind of things, and even the issue of movement logistics of goods and services across the continent many of our shipping and postal services are still tied to our colonial roots such that if you need to send something to johannesburg from lagos that thing will either go to london or new york and come back it's just <laughs> a few of these shipping agencies that are now working by the time you do this round trip you find out that the cost of the final product on delivery is so expensive so that expensive. it doesn't make sense. And then also time and time to market is a challenge. Even when we're trying to travel between uh, the various countries in Africa, if I want to go to uh, Conakry, somebody who is going to uh, Australia would have reached before me going to Conakry. And then also, if I need to go to Johannesburg, unless I take South African Airlines, I will have to go round trip that somebody that is going to London would have reached before myself or going to Namibia. So th that issue, the issue of connectivity within Africa for movement of people, goods and services is there. The other one is exchange, interchanging. When I sell my products, if I'm in uh, Cameroon, I should be able to be paid in my local currency, even if my goods went to 
Namibia or it went to Zambia. Mm -hmm. That aspect is telling a lot, especially on the SMEs, the micro and small enterprises. Now we have trade platforms. We have trade platforms. We have opportunities for virtual trading and shipping. If we can overcome those things and the logistics and the clearance of goods, it will have a lot of impact on our creative industry, including the clothing, the textiles, the local arts and crafts, and, and our natural products. Some of our natural products have expiry dates. You can ship something and for six months, it's still on transit. It will arrive expired. Yeah. So those kind of things, we hope that the technocrats and the politicians will see that and that when these SMEs and companies and corporations thrive, there will be taxes. And those taxes are revenues to the government to provide services to people. True. Uh, and if the environment is thriving, you don't take flights to go look for foreign investors. If the environment is conducive, yeah. foreign direct investment will come. Definitely. You don't need to take a whole trip of 50 people going to do promotions yeah. abroad. If it's yeah. good, they will come to the African continent. And there are many corporates that are within Africa that have a lot of funds but they need the safety. So one of the things that uh, APSS is looking at is also de-risking Africa because some of the governments come up with regulations and policies. Investors invest long term and you invest based on projections and all those calculations and some of them are funds borrowed on a long term basis. And then in five years, you see policy flip flop that throws the numbers out of sync. And it can destroy some of the entities because they made those projections. They took a long-term view to invest in an economy. And then the politicians change the policy just like that. And sometimes there's no engagement. So part of the APSS work is that it's okay. Situations change. There might be change. But let there be engagement. Because, for instance, it's out of engagement that the private sector cried about the skills and the competencies around to feed the workplace. And that's why we have the AETF, African Education Trust Fund, to look at the institutions that are churning out the graduates and even the technical vocational schools so that these skills are occupied. Not everybody is going to have the uh, white collar job. There are blue collar job, but there should be standards. There should be career paths and there should be KYC so that people will feel safe to allow people to get into their homes and their offices. So that's that's just about it. But it's a good thing that we're speaking. We had a chance to speak at Gabi, the Global Compact event, and myself, Mr. Wendell Ade, the founder of APSS, and of the Spio Garba, the chair. Of Some connection um, problem. Okay, so I'll be back with Dr. Lucy in a moment. I think there's a network problem. So, is Mr. John there? Hello? Is Mr. John online? They're indicating to me that we lost Mr. John too. I think it's a network problem. So, can they just connect back through the, the, the link that I sent to them? and so that we can continue the program. So while waiting for them, let's watch this sort of video on other summits that have been taking place to impact the continent and how to change things because we have discovered if we don't trade externally, if we don't try to sell what we have, and not only selling it raw, but selling it as a finished product, which is where we can really get the money that we need to use. If the government only sells just internally and little money, we cannot live on that money. And that's what is making, we are always on AIDS and AIDS, which is never enough. So so it is high time all the governments think of opening their borders, trading with other countries. Look at Rwanda and Kenya that have opened their borders. If you're in Africa, you don't need a visa to go to Rwanda. You don't need a visa to go to Kenya. Because of this, hundreds and hundreds of business people are flooding into these countries, looking for workers, moving up and down. And that's how the economy is turning. All these barriers you want to go to uh, Namibia, you need to go through a whole process, two weeks, three weeks. All these business people don't want that. They want to be able to get their business in, get their products 
works out as easy as possible but this is not the case with many african countries and that is really hindering the product progress in the economic sector most of them are even unable to rectify just the african continental free trade era uh, document to show that they want to be part of it because all what the document or the the institution is trying to put down is that they need to be security in the continent first of all which will allow investors to come into the continent and invest they need to have policies in place that will make these investors secure so that when they put their business in place two years three years some war civil war something is not going to break out and make them lose everything no business person want to get into a society like that so they need to be a stable political system a stable economy and they need to be security when they are their security they are sure that if they come in with their millions and their businesses and they invest in your country they'll be able to have their return and not get war and some group spoil everything for them secondly the visa process and all the the exit and entry process is just so complicated roads in the country is a problem you want to travel with your product from here to here some of these perishable goods you are not going to make them on time all of them will get bad on the way why can we not make roads that are easy to carry what we have to where we need them and then make things easy for people to exchange with each other and have the final product for us to be able to sell it out there economically we can do it but politically no because politics does not bring the money economic brings the money so each country should be thinking of, about this and also how to boost the economy let's follow what is happening in east africa they are not the best they are not perfect but when it comes to business and economy they are starting to understand it it's not perfect because they still have a lot of things to do for example kenya which has just opened its borders to everything kenya exports flowers tea to the uh, to the uk their former colonial master but uk exports cars technology all things that they sell them very expensive they export it to kenya how do they measure up with tea and flour that they export to to kenya or, or other agri agricultural product it does not match up so even though they are trying but they need to step up what they are doing and it is going to give the best of what we are expecting so let's watch this video Let's watch this video, which still talks about what the African Private uh, Sector Summit is doing, and then we'll be right back after that. So let's watch this video. A thriving private sector is essential for Africa to achieve inclusive growth, but structural... Wendell, you are the chair of the Africa Private Sector Summit. We're here at this conference talking about the real importance of private-public partnerships. Tell me more about the work that you do and why it's so important in this context. The work we focus on is trying to look at creating an enabling business environment, similarly stated, a conducive investment climate uh, in Africa. We want to change this narrative that Africa is a bad place to, to work. So we think that uh, we can uh, bring the private sector together and uh, promote the after agenda, the protocols that were signed by the heads of states, we think this will make a difference, this will change the narrative, this will change the dynamics in terms of uh, investment across the continent. And so tell me, what are some of the biggest obstacles you hear from the private sector about doing business in Africa and how can we change that? Uh, the, the challenges are many, uh, uh, access to finance, uh, civil unrest, uh, policies that are not conducive uh, in the countries across the continent, infrastructure, all of these are, in a nutshell, the basic problems across the continent. So if we were to focus on galvanizing the private sector to appreciate the AFTA. AFTA protocols uh, are embedded with key elements signed by the heads of states, free mm -hmm. movement of people, a, a currency that is exchangeable of, across the continent, um, common passport, infrastructure issues, health issues. If we can come together and appreciate what I consider a gift, the AFTA as a gift to the private sector, then we'll make a difference. Absolutely, because I mean, this, this promise of the free trade agreement, everything you said, you know, the currency, the passport, Africa would really, like its power, would just explode. So how can we make that promise a reality? What kind of actual concrete action do we need to see between now and this time next year when we're here again? You know, uh, 
this conference, the speakers at this conference have articulated these issues, all right? And most of the people, the presidents, the banks, at the Sena, the president of uh, Kenya, and a, a number of others have articulated these issues. What we need to do now is to, the private sector, come together and get our leaders to sign up on an Africa Private Sector Bill of Rights for an enabling business environment. That would, uh, this time next year, we should have a document that is ready to go to the heads of states for them to adopt. This is the simplest, easiest, fastest way under which we can have uh, after implemented, the REX protocols implemented, is to the private sector must come together, unite, and ensure that these things are done. That will be the success story of this conference, a, a UN Compact. That will be the success story. If, the, if these various elements will come together, uh, support to uh, uni unify, rather support this kind of agenda for what we refer to righting the wrongs of doing business in Africa, then I think we will be making some ski headways in terms of Africa's development and transformation. And so that's exactly what you are doing, is bringing these people together so that you can take it, right, to these heads of state. That is correct. And so this correct. time next year, we're going to be having a conversation about how you've done that. Well, we're kind of a little late. We think uh, by 2025, after 2025, there we go. The ADU heads of states meet uh, annually in February. And so we're hoping that uh, by 2024, that will be a discussion. And by 2025, we would have had a document in, in the hands of the heads of states for the adoption. So my last question to you, obviously you've spoken about like a lot of potential, a lot of ambition of things that could be great, but right now what is it that you see as the biggest promise, the biggest potential in Africa? The biggest promise, the biggest potential in Africa lies in one, revamping the education system to produce the skill sets to uh, transform your natural resources, your, your agriculture sector, your, your resources in oil in, in the waterways, the ocean and waterways. So you have, I normally refer to it as uh, the company of the ocean and waterways where you have natural resources, you have your soil, the ground, you can uh, reap uh, from it uh, your natural resources as well as uh, agriculture. And from the skies, you have what? You have uh, solar, mm -hmm. right? You have water. It's renewable so, energy. Yeah, so we have all of these things that are favorable for the continent. We just need to produce the skill sets. And this is why we have another component of what we do called the Africa Education Trust Fund. That body is focused on transforming the continent uh, educational system to deliver the skill sets so that businesses whether it is uh, your basic service industry, whether it's uh, in the industrial sector, whether it's even government, public service sector, would have the skill sets to meet, to be able to meet the demands of both public and private uh, sectors. Fantastic. So you've got the skill set that's going on in one area, you're trying to get the private sector to get together in the other, and when these two come together, then Africa is really going to be a powerhouse the bread basket for the world. For the world, yes. wonderful. For the world, Africa is the world basket, the bread basket for the world, actually. So you just watched that African business initiative there, ladies and gentlemen. We're sorry about the technical fault. We have connection problems, and it's from the technical area. So we're almost at the end of the program. We had just like five minutes to the end of the program. So we're going to look for another edition to take Dr. Lucy Newman back on shore because she's the CEO, she's the head of the African Private Sector Farming Summit, and they have been doing a lot. We had a whole lot prepared for you today. We exhausted.
hosted part but we have another edition we take other people and she to also come back on board to talk more about the activities and their projects they have a lot of projects that are in the pipeline and so she's going to tell us about it we also thank very much uh, mr john bosco who was here with us we should take note that he's an economist he's also the head of the east african business council that is the ceo so we had top people to talk about the growth of africa economically and to tell us so far what their different institutions have been doing and how they've been helping to boost the african continent we should take note that it is true and it is real that the educational system in Africa is not bad, but we are focused on theory. That is the problem. All you when you speak to all the experts, they tell you our problem is we're focused on theory. So when the business people even come with their business, where are the skills? Everybody has the theory, but they don't have the field skills that are needed to work in these companies. And so we need to change the narrative. Governments need to look for ways to change their curriculum, put technology, put the skills that are needed in and out. And this will definitely attract other business people to come in. And then we also have another problem of the currency, movement from one place to the other, security. All those things are very, very negative things that work against the countries, which make us stay in the same place instead of growing up. People will continue crossing the Mediterranean Sea, continue dying because they don't have enough back home. The government cannot employ everybody in the country we need to boost the private sector how can we boost the private sector when all these opportunities all these problems they have are not being solved so ladies and gentlemen we'll look for another edition to talk about this more because this is very important and we think this is the area where change will come from and that will make the economy in the african continent grow tremendously because the continent is the bread basket for the world not only africa thank you very much for watching this edition stay tuned to programs on Africa media i'll see you again yet probably tomorrow for another edition god bless you all Thank you.